Erev Tov, Bukhim Abayim. Thank you for coming tonight. So, Bezat Hashem, for the next hour, we'll be discussing something that I found to be a very interesting topic, something that's very pertinent to this uh, period of the year. And it's regarding the Avodah of the Kohen Gadol that he did in the time of the Bet Migdash and the Mishkan. Approximately ceased to have been for about 2,000 years already. So, the reason that I figured that it's an appropriate thing to have a shiur on this very topic is because I came across a very interesting Mamlo Ez. And he speaks about the concept of Yom Kippur and how back in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, when there was tremendous sacrifices being done every day, and especially on Yom Kippur, the time of day in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, which is a day of atonement for all of B'nai Israel, And at that time, Chazal tells us that the atonement was only capable of being done only if the Kohen Gadol would be able to perform the services in the correct manner. And if that were to be um, done so as well, so all of Bnei Yisrael would have re received atonement for being such. However, nowadays we don't have, unfortunately, the Beit HaMikdash and Kohen Gadol to do the services. But as a substitute to that, we recite in the Musaf prayer of Yom Kippur, the entire Seder HaAvodah. And throughout this Seder HaAvodah, it discusses word for word, basically, all the sequences of actions that the Kohen Gadol would do throughout this period. And it's supposed to come as a substitute for us to be of a, rem of a remembrance for that which was done in the past. Therefore, I feel that it was very necessary for us to be able to connect to it to some level, whether to a greater or lesser extent. However, the pshat of it, the simple explanation of it will be understood B'zat Hashem within this shiur. So we'll begin this shiur discussing the very beginning of that which is spoken about in Masechet Yoma and Daf Bet Amud Aleph. And it says over there, talking about the period before Yom Kippur. And it starts off speaking about the week before Yom Kippur. And over there at the point, a week, a week before Yom Kippur, it already talks about the hecticness that was going on in Yerushalayim. And it says how all the members of the, of the elite of Bnei Israel, including the king, including the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin and his right-hand man, the Av Beidin, including all the 71 members of the Sanhedrin, and all the, all the tremendous people that are influenced of Am Yisrael, they would come to the home of the Kohen Gadol in Yerushalayim, and they would sit down amongst themselves, and they would speak to him tremendous words of Musa. And over there, they would tell him the importance of his Avodah. They would tell him that the only way Bnei Yisrael can achieve the the rectification to achieve the repentance that is necessary for them to continue on for the following year can only be done if he would be sure to make sure that the Avodah was done correctly as we said before. And if he was unable to do so, Bnei Yisrael with Chas Shalom would be prevented from receiving this repentance that they were seeking out for. As such, of course, he would be very, he would be scared. The tremendous fear that would come into his heart because he would know that everything was dependent upon him. And with having such a burden on his shoulders, he would have to make sure that everything was done appropriately to the best, best of his capabilities. As such, after this Musa was given, they would speak to him with tremendous words of strength. The king promised to the king Gadol that if he was successful in this mission to bring repentance upon all of Bnei Israel, great honor would be given to the Kohen Gadol and there would be tremendous lavishness that would be followed afterwards. So after this moment, after all the pe people of B'nai, of the Yerushalayim, the elite would come to his home, they'd walk him through, for, through his house and towards Har Habayit, which is unfortunately where the Arab mosque is leading today. But back then, as we know, there's once upon a time the Beit HaMikdash, and Bezat Hashem, Bezman Kolov, it will be the third Beit HaMikdash as well. Amen. <laughs> and it speaks about the travels that would go. Thank you. It speaks about the travels that would go from his home all the way to Harabayit. And it says that there was a tremendous parade of people. And all of the people of Yerushalayim would walk with the Kohen Gadol. And they would greet him and bring him over to the Harabayit. All the way to the very footsteps of the mountain. And upon arrival of the mountain, the Kohen Gadol, he would face all of the people that had escorted him to the Harabayit. And he would recite a prayer. He would recite a special prayers that was going to ask for there to be peace amongst all the Bnei David, the, the future kings of, of Israel, and also for the Kohanim through which their services would bring about tremendous um, peace and, and prosperity for all Bnei Israel, and also that the Beit HaMikdash should find peace amongst itself, that it should 
constantly be <coughs> pursued by the nation and to be cut, kept up, up to date, and so on and so forth. Now from this point onwards, we're going to look at this map over here to understand, now that we reached the Harabite, now what are we looking at is the, is the Bayit itself, in which the Kohen Gadol would reside for the next seven days. Now if we look, I recorded the directions in which it is going to be expressed, north, south, east, west is not given, but we already know based on directions. So what would happen is, the Kohen Gadol, he would be facing the east of the mountain, east inside of the mountain, and he was he would not be going into the very holes itself, right, from, um, from the inside holes all the way to wherever he would have to go to. However, he was bidden to go completely around it to circumscribe the mountain from here. So now he faced the east side of the mountain and walk all the way to the north and reach a certain corridor located right here as abbreviated Lamed Pei for Lishkat Par Hedrin. And this room over here was a room that was designated specifically for the Kohen Gadol, in which he would reside for the next seven days. And basically it would be his own home. He could live there, he could sleep there, he could do whatever he wanted over there because that's where his residence would, would be uh, abided by for the next seven days. So what's interesting about this place, this Lishkat Pahar Dreen, is that it does not open to what we call the Azara, which is the courtyard of the Beit HaMikdash. And this courtyard, so it's basically from this pink dotted line that I drew over here and extends all the way to the end. Now, why is this important is because Chachamim tell us that the only ones who are allowed to sit down and all the more so lay down in anywhere within the presidents of the Azara is only the king of Israel, the, the Melech. So all the Levim and the Koranim were not allowed to sit down on the very Azara. That would not only include the Azara, but any doorway or a room that had a doorway that would go into the Azara. Now the Lishkat HaPahadrin, we see right over here, there was one room that came right in front of it. So since it did not open specifically into the, into the Azara, he was allowed to live there and, and lay down there and sleep over there without any problems. Otherwise, it would have been very problematic for him to do so because he would have to live in the Beit HaMikdash and the inability to sleep would be very costly to his health, of course. So, that was his special chamber that he would reside for the next seven days. And then, after this, the, the um, processes of purification and training would occur for him to come to this um, magnificent day of Yom Kippur. Now, there was a concern that the Kohen Gadol, he would be ritually impure because perhaps he came in contact with a dead body. Now, coming into contact with a dead body, of course, would prevent him from performing the services of course, because he cannot come into, into the Azara or to do any of the Avodah that was required for that day. And therefore, due to only a possible concern, they made him go through the purification process that was reckoned with through the Prah Duma, the red heifer. And we know from the Torah that tells us that he would have to go, that... Um, a vessel that was made out of earthenware would be filled with spring water and ashes, a small amount of ashes from the Parah Duma would be poured inside of it. It would be a mixed wall. Then they would take three hyssop stems. <coughs> they would bundle them together. <coughs> so they have three hyssop stems that would be bundled together. And then they would um, take it inside of the, um, the vessel, mix it around, and then sprinkle onto the Kohen Gadol. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they would do this twice throughout the seven day period. The Torah prescribes on the third and seventh day of the purification process. So, for example, if he came on the first day, <clears throat> was on a Sunday morning, therefore the purification would come on the third day and on the seventh day, which would be Shabbat. However, this was not exactly so because since it was only perhaps a, a concern in which he was originally impure, therefore it would be actually removed one day in advance, which would be the sixth day, which would come into a Friday. So that would be his necessary uh, precautions for, for any um, impurification that could have possibly happened within the previous time. And more than that, he was told that he had to separate from his wife for that period onwards so that he would not be considered a Balkari, a person who had an, um, an omission as we know. So he would also not be considered ritually impure from that point onward. 
Now, in order for him to be considered familiar with the Avodah that would happen on Yom Kippur, he would have to be going through seven days of rigorous training in which every day he would be told to do the exact same um, sequence of events that would occur throughout the, uh, throughout the Yom Kippur uh, day. Now we know that every day in the Beit HaMikdash there was a Korban Tamid that was going to be given twice a day. One in the morning as the Torah prescribes and one in the afternoon. Now the Korban Tamid had many, many parts to it. And there was many different um, sequences of events that had to occur for it to be considered an entire, entire list of things. So just to go off several, uh, just a um, few key points about it, we're going to discuss um, the basics of the, of the Korban Tamid. So the Gemara Masecha Tamid gives, talks about four lotteries that were drawn daily for the Kohanim to be able to be, have the honor to be part of the Korban Tamid ceremony, if we should call it. So the first one was, the first person to win the lottery, he'd be given the honor of known as Tumat Hadeshin. Which basically is, he goes to the altar, which is the Mizbeach that I drew over here, and any of the ashes that were going to be laid, laid on that was considered to be obstructing the, path, the passage to the Mizbeach, it was the job of the Kohen, he was going to go and to scoop the ashes and to lay it on the floor right next to the altar. And Chazal tell us there was a tremendous miracle that happened in the time of the first Beit HaMikdash in which the floor of the Azara was able to swallow the entire ashes that was scooped onto the floor. And it was a tremendous, miraculous thing. So nobody actually had to go and scoop it outside of the Beit HaMikdash for the cleanliness. Um, the second lottery was, um, was those who were in charge of the Shechita, the slaughtering of the sheep that was done for the Tamid. And there's a number of things that was done for this. So the first one was the Shechita itself, which was the slaughtering of the animal. Then we're going to see is the receiving and the sprinkling of the blood. So they had to receive the blood into a vessel that was from the animal that was, that was shechted. And they had to sprinkle the blood, as we're going to see, on the Mizbeach. And there was a certain manner in which this had to be done. Then, the third part was, we're going to see that the, the inner altar, which is in the Heichal over here, the inner altar was the altar that was responsible for the burning of the incense, the Ketoret. And the collecting of ashes had to be done there as well. Fourth was the collecting of the ashes of the menorah that had lit the previous night. And the next six of them describes the bringing of various organs into the Mizbeach for them to be burnt by the Kohen. The eleventh would be the Mincha offering, the flower offering. The twelfth would be um, the Chavitin offering, which was basically the offering that had to be brought by the Kohen Gadol twice a day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, similar to the Tamid offering. So what consisted was, was a flower offering, which the Torah tells us is a tenth of Evifa, which is approximately half a gallon worth of flour that was mixed in hot, hot water, baked afterwards, and then it would be put into a frying pan with, with, a lot of, with about three log of, of um, oil, which is about approximately one liter, and then it would be brought into the Mizbeach for burning as well. That was the Chavitin comes from the word machvat in, in Hebrew, which means a frying pan. And finally, the 13th of this was the yain hanasachim, which is the wine libations that we brought down to the Mizbech as well. So we see that the Mizbech was a very key component into all these, um, um, the Tamid offerings. The third lottery that would took place would to be, was um, designated for the Kohanim that had the opportunity to bring the Qatarit into the Hechal, where it would be placed on the inner, inner altar. And the second Kohen would be the one who would light it up. Finally, the last one would be the burning of the Tamid itself, which a Kohen would be, have the honor to take all the pieces that were brought up to him and to throw into the Mizbeach. And that basically is the essence of the whole Korban Tamid that was done daily in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, the, Kor, the Kohen Gadol, he was given the honor to do four of these jobs. Now his jobs were listed as such. He would collect the blood from the, from the korban tamid, from the sheep that was slaughtered, and he would be the one who would sprinkle onto the mizbeach. Second, he would burn the katarit in the heichal, as we said earlier. Third, he would be the one that's setting up the lamps for the menorah. And fourth, he would be the one who would burn the, the tamid offering every day for, for those seven days. Now, 
just to describe, because we're going to see this process exa happening exactly the same way on Yom Kippur, how the spring of the blood was. Now, if we look on the Mizbeach, we have four corners. We have the southeastern corner, the northeastern corner, we have the northwestern corner, and the southwestern corner. Okay? Now what he would do, he would have to sprinkle the blood on two of these corners. But he had to do it in such a way, and when it was sprinkled on one of the edge, it would not sprinkle on only one side, but rather go on two sides simultaneously. Understand? So as sprinkling over here, it would reach the north side and the east side. And when sprinkling over here, on the southwest, it would simultaneously go onto the west side and the south side as well. So by two sprinklings, the, according to the words of Chazal, it was able to reach four sides with two sprinklings. All right? So that was the sprinkling of the blood. Next, what we have to discuss is how they would engage in the throwing of the, of the meats of the tamid into the Mizbeach. So the Mizbeach had four sections, which I marked in red over here to denote the, the fireplace, let's call it, that was going to take place. So there's one very large one and three smaller ones that surrounded it. And the one large one was in the southeastern corner as we see, southeast. It was in this large one where the Kohen would take all the Tamid offerings and throw it inside this fire pit over here. The other three had other designated options. The second one would be designated only specifically for Yom Kippur, in which he would take all the coal that would be found over here and use it for the burning of the Ketarit, as we're going to see later on. The third was specifically for, for Ketarit that was done on a regular basis. And the fourth was for, was for constant use, basically because the Torah prescribes for us to have a constant fire. It was uh, called the Esh Tamid. And because it had to have a constant fire, this one had to be constantly maintained. And, and logs had to be, be refueling on a constant basis. That was his job. Now for these seven days, that's what he would be doing constantly. And in, to, in order to ensure that he was familiar with the work, the Chachamim at the time would test him repeatedly to make sure that he knew what was going on. So any time that he slipped up in something, they would say, review the law, review the law, tell us the law, make sure you know, because it comes Chaz Shalom and Yom Kippur and you don't know what's going on, it's going to be very problematic. Because again, we said earlier that the necessity for him to perform the Avodah um, to the best of his ability was great. Because all of the repentance of B'nai Yisrael was required about it. Therefore, they had to make sure that he knew what he was doing to the best of his knowledge. Finally, once they knew that he was very well um, knowledgeable in all the areas of, the, of his study, came the seventh day. And on the seventh day, after performing all the services, they take him to a place known as the Shah HaNikonor, known as the Gate of Nikonor, which is right by the pink line. And it was the line, it was the gate that opened from the Ezrat Nashim, which is the courtyard where the woman would stand, and <coughs> the, the Azara, Ezrat Nashim. And it opened up to the Azara for the men, which denoted for the Israelim and the Kohanim that passed this green dotted line as well afterwards. Now what happened was the Kohanim Gadol, he would stand on the seventh day by the Shah HaNikonor and he would face eastwards, facing outside. And as he was facing eastwards, there would be a, a line of animals that would pass through, goats, rams, sheep, and so on and so forth. They would pass through one by one and it was done so he'd be able to be familiar with all the animals that he would work with the following day, which would end up being Yom Kippur. So this was in order for him to get a sense of awe, for him to know what was going on shortly afterwards. That was on the seventh day of the service. Now, on this very day, Chachamim made sure that he would be eating foods that would not heat up his body. The reason was because we know that, according to the Rambam, that certain foods that heat up the body, they would cause a, a nocturnal emission which caused him to be a Baal Keri and become Tamei, invalidating him from the services that would occur on Yom Kippur. Therefore, they had to make sure that he would have a healthy diet. The cooling diet. <coughs> the cooling diet. Um, finally, very important, was that after that was done, on the night beforehand, they would come to him and they'd bring him 
to a certain room known as the Shah HaMaim, which is brought down by the southern entrance of the Beit HaMikdash. This room also consisted another chamber, which is known as the Beit Avit Nas. Now the Beit Avit Nas was where the Ketorot was, was produced. Why is it called this name? It's because the Avinas family was the ones who knew the secret of the Ketorot. They were the only ones who knew the, the precise measurement in which, which um, compounds were required in order to make the Ketorot, in order for it to come up in a smoke, in a smoking fashion, just the way that Kadosh Baruch Hu loves it. And because the secret was known only to them, therefore it was regarded and known as the Beit Avit Nas. And it was here that they would prepare everything. So they would bring the Kohen Gadol on the seventh day to this room. And they make him swear that when he comes to the Kodesh HaKodeshim, he would not mess up. What does that mean? Is that there was a very big machloket in the time of Chazal in which they had an agreement between the Chachamim and the Sadducees, the Tzidukim, which we know were the ones who did not accept the Old Torah. And they had a disagreement upon at which point the incense was supposed to be lit. All right? According to the Tzidukim, they assumed that the incense had to be lit prior to the entrance of the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Because as we're going to see later on, that the, the climax of the Avodah was the, the entrance of the Kohen Gadol into the Kodesh HaKodeshim, in which he is going to lit the incense in fire. And it's over there that all the tefillot will be accepted. According to the Tzidukim, they assumed that it had to be lit prior to the entrance of the Kodesh HaKodeshim in the Heichal, which is the chamber that led into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. But Chachamim argued, and they said, said no. In reality, upon entrance to the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the incense had to be lit, and it's only over there that a person could be able to make the correct call, and everything would be fine afterwards. Bezat Hashem. So they had to make him swear that he would not change the order of things. They had to make him swear that he would not light before entry into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Because if that was the case, Chas Shalom, he would die. Because that was already a um, punishment that was, that was liable by death. So he would swear, he would make the promise, and then afterwards they would review with him all the laws that was required. Basically the same thing, that he had to bring it in such a fashion and make sure to light it upon entrance and not before the entrance. Finally, we come to the Yom Kippur night. This is the night in which he was, he was uh, told that he was not allowed to sleep at all because again, there was a concern that he would become a Balakari. And because of that, he was supposed to be teaching Torah to all the Chachamim of Bnei Israel. And if he was not a Torah scholar, he would be learning Torah all, all the night through. And in the event in which anybody saw him to be falling asleep, what they would do is they would constantly uh, like snap their fingers, the time to wake up, or like wash his face with water to make sure that he would not sleep in order to prevent from such a problem happening. And finally, we come to Yom Kippur Day. And this is the most busiest day of the year because tremendous amount of things were happening all around the place. And to understand everything that's going to be going on, I listed over here a number of sacrifices that we're going to see going throughout the day. And we just gave a short list over here, and this is basically the gist of it all. So we're going to see, as we said earlier, that you have the morning tamid and afternoon tamid that was given every day, twice a day. Later on, we'll see the musaf, which means, as we know, is the additional offerings, as we have on Shabbat or on Yom Tov. We know we have an extra musaf prayer. And this prayer corresponds to the extra sacrifices that would be, that would be to be brought down. And for Yom Kippur, specifically, one bull, seven sheep, one goat, and the ram. And finally, because of the greatness of Yom Kippur, it had its, its own uh, series of sacrifices that were to be brought. And they were known as Korbanat Hayom. They were the sacrifices of the day. And you'll see, as you can see in the sheet that I handed on beforehand, they have all the listed over there. And the Kohen Agadol, he had his own sacrifices that he had to bring down. And there were one bull for a sin offering known as the Khatat. And there was a one ram for an elevation offering known as the Ola. Similarly, the nation, the people of Am Yisrael, had their own offering that the Kohen Gadol would bring. And there were two goats for a Khatat, which, as we're going to see, was one for Hashem, the famous Pasuk, one for Hashem and one for Azazel, which would denote the cliff in which it's going to be pushed off. And there was going to be one ram for an elevation offering, the Ola. 
And finally, the grand of all, the ketoret, the incense that would be brought to the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Now the day started with the Kohen Gadol coming with his regular mundane, mundane clothes and he would go into the mikvah in the place as we saw before known as the Shar Hamaim, which is the gate of the water because as you could imagine because it contained water over there for the mikvah. And it was over there that he would tovel himself and this was the first of five immersions that he would do throughout the day. And before toveling himself, what he would do is he would wash his hands and he would wash his feet as we did in the Daim. And afterwards, he would immerse himself and put on his regular clothing, which is known as the, the, the gold clothing that he, he would wear. And after that, after, upon putting it on, he would wash his hands and feet again. And he would continue with all the offerings that were to be done within the, within the day. And the first one that would start is the slaughtering of the tamid. As we stated, he would be the one that would make sure that he would um, slaughter the tamid and make sure that his blood would be sprinkled. So he would go, take the sheep, which is the very first one, take the sheep for the morning, the morning tamid, and slaughter it himself, and he would collect its blood. So there goes the first one. The morning tamid is gone. Slaughtering the sheep, collect his blood, put it into a vessel, and he would run to the Mizbeach. And over there, as we stated, he would be sprinkling the blood on the south eastern corner, right? I'm sorry, on the northeastern corner and the southwestern corner. Two sprinkles that would go on all four sides simultaneously, and that's how it was done. Afterwards, he would go to the Hechal, he would prepare the menorah, all the seven menorot over there, all the seven lamps, and for it to be burned the following night. Following that, he would go near the menorah. There was the inner, the inner altar, known as the Mizbech HaPrimi, where the um, ketot would be burnt, and he would burn the incense over there. Next, what would happen, as we stated earlier, that there were Kohanim that had the opportunity to bring all the limbs of the Tamil offering up to the Kohen Gadol. And the Kohen Gadol would accept them by the Mizbeach and he would throw them into this fire bin over here. The first one. He would burn everything. Finally, he would bring his Chavitin offering, which we stated earlier, was the wheat offering, which is the breads that he would bring one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And afterwards, he would bring his libation of wine offering, where he would take um, a given amount of wine and he'd pour it down which is known in a place known as the Yesod of the Mizbeach, which basically means the foundation, the base of the Mizbeach. And at the very bottom of the Mizbeach, basically there were two holes that led into like a pipe system into a river in Jerusalem. So he would pour it into these two holes. It would go down and that would fulfill the obligation for the wine offering that was required for the Tamid offering. And that takes care of the Tamid. Now we get into the into the day of Yom Kippur itself. With the Musaf offering, as we stated earlier, requires the bull, the seven sheep, the goat, and the ram. And at this point, he would slaughter one bull and seven lambs and perform the exact same service as before. So there goes one bull, seven sheep over here. Now comes the second tevilah, something that's very important. Chazal tell us, that every time he had to tovel, every time the Kohen Hagodol had a tovel, it was because he was making a very big transition. It means that he was about to enter into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And every time he came out of the Kodesh HaKodeshim to work back in the Azara with the Mizbeach or anything else outside of it, he would have to re himself. So this back and forth movement from the Kodesh HaKodeshim back into the Azara, from the Azara back into the Kodesh HaKodeshim required each a separate tevila. And because of that, in this point of the second Tevilah, he was required to immerse himself so he would be able to be pure enough to come into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And this was not in the same place as before. The first place we stated was in the Shar Hamayim, which was in the southern end over here. However, all four remaining immersions would be taken in a different place, which is just um, southeast to the, Miz, to, the, um, to the Mizbeach, 
which is known as the Lashkat HaParva. Lashkat HaParva, which means the Chamber of Parva, and it was named after the person who actually built the place itself. Interestingly enough, he was a sorcerer, he was a big magician, and he ended up doing Teshuvah, according to Rashi. And the way it was built was that the mikvah was, uh, was located in the roof of this chamber, but the pipe system in which the water would travel into the mikvah was completely hidden from all sight. So because of that, it gave like this magical view as if the water was filling itself into the pool without anything intervening. So because of that, it was considered a magical place according to many people, and therefore they denoted it by that name, by the man, his family name was Parva, as such, it was known as Lishkata Parva. So all four remaining tefillot, the immersions, would occur in this very chamber over here. So at this point, <coughs> he would go into the Lishkata Parva, and he would change from his gold vestments into the new white vestments, which would denote a, a, a significance of purity that was required for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give mercy to all B'nai Israel so that he'd remove them from all sin. And <coughs> at this point, At this point, we come and he brings the bull that was designated for his own sin offering, as we stated earlier. The Kohen HaGadol, we stated, had to bring his own bull offering for the Korban HaToyom. And over there, what he would do is, he would come to this bull and he would announce his own, his own vidui, his own confessions, any sins that he did. For himself, or for, Kohanim, for his family, he would confess everything over there. And as we know, the standard, the standard text for the Vidu, it starts with, Ana Hashem Chatati Avidi Pashati, as the Rambam brings down in Hachot Tishuvah. And instead of saying, as we're going to see this common theme throughout the entire service, instead of saying, the standard way of saying Hashem's name, Amonai, as, we're generally, do, as we generally do, however, he stated in the name in which it was properly um, expounded by, which is named as the Shem HaMifarash, the ineffable name in which we're not allowed to say it, and if it would, were to be said, it would be Chayav Mita for this. So upon saying this name, Ana Hashem, in the Shem HaMifarash, all the Kohanim and the Levi'im that were found in the Beit HaMikdash, they would prostrate themselves on the floor, and this already denotes the practice that we do during the Musaf in which we prostrate ourselves to commemorate that very act. However, like you would pronounce it in different pronunciation, so it wasn't just like that. It was every one is a different uh, punctuation, so it would be actually pronounced different. All right. So, so I just found out that each one was not exactly in the same manner, but rather each one had a spe specific pronunciation, which deferred each time that it was pronounced. Now, you can find it in your Sudorim. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Let's just do the end of part one because I want to dive in army, okay? If you don't mind. Should I, a few minutes? Yeah, fine. I just want to do, just say the end of part one, and we're going to continue. All right. Okay? All right. So, just to sum, of, sum this off, is that upon hearing the Shem HaMefarash, they would pressure themselves, and they would not allow themselves to hear the name. They would fall on their faces onto the ground and say, Baruch Shem Kivon Machotol Lam Ve'ed. Right? Blesses His name for, forever and ever. So they would not hear this name being said. Because according to the Midrash, when the, when the Kohen Gadol would say this name, the Pasuk says, Yotzimi Pei Kohen Gadol, that it would leave the mouth of the Kohen Gadol, meaning that it would be heard from a very far distance. It wouldn't just be stated, but rather leave completely into a very far proximity. So therefore, they were able to hear it even as far as a place as the Ezrat Nashim. Therefore, they made sure to say it very loudly so they would be considered not heard. And at this point, we'll finish part one and come back to you as soon as we can. Good.